Okay, welcome back, everyone. Let's get uh, started. Okay, so we we've been looking at Shabak, and we will, we've been seeing you know how uh, our expression of praise and worship to God, um, you know, must be scriptural, must be rooted in the Word of God, and it, it's a very liberating thing. Yeah, sure. The, the the question I want to ask is uh, in one of the churches uh, in my former church so they told me not to say lift your hands and worship so not to instruct the not believer, to not uh, church to tell to anything okay. not to tell anything because we don't feel like it mm. and uh, what do you say for that pastor okay so the reason was we don't feel like it we don't feel so like don't uh, Force us, don't uh, think so. See, it's it's a um, uh, it's a fine line in the sense. Yes, we don't have to force people, but we can always invite people to do it. You know, when we say, um, you know, lift your hands in worship, it's a scriptural thing, or let's shout out uh, to God with a voice of triumph. It's it's a scriptural thing. Let's applaud the Lord. It's a scriptural thing. So uh, sometimes, yes, like I said, you know these. Church, church, different backgrounds have different uh, traditions and uh, um, maybe understanding of it or lack of understanding. So they may not feel comfortable. Like the, the best way to do it is uh, to really draw things out, you know, to maybe one thing would be to let's say we have all these seven words. Um, take one word for every Sunday and just talk about it. Hey, this is what before we start worship you know as a uh, you know before we start the service maybe as a exhortation saying do you know this is what is there you know and then uh, and it's perfectly fine it's in the word of god so just go ahead and do it so um so that will be something right so yeah sometimes people are shy sometimes people are not used to it not comfortable but it takes time but we can journey right so and this is that is why this uh, short exhortation before we start. We can actually use it for that. So when we, when people see it in the word, and when we, people see that hey, it is biblical, and it's not just the, you know, the whims and fancies of the worship leader, and he's saying, you know, uh, come on, lift your hand, shout aloud, do that. This, it's not his desire or it's not his thing. It's there in the word of God. Then people will feel comfortable. Okay. Um, sometimes. We worship in prayer. So what's the difference between prayer and worship and praises? Okay, so so prayer we know is, uh, uh, again, a communication with God. Um, and there are different kinds of prayers, as you may be studying, like intercession, prayer of thanksgiving, prayer of agreement, and prayer of faith, and so on, as we see in the Bible. Um, so that's prayer. And praise and worship, of course, we've been seeing, uh, looking at it, praises. Um, a loud commendation, approval, um, uh, complimenting someone, and then and lifting up, um, giving worth to it. All that is praise. Worship can be a verbal, vocal, but it also is very uh, reflective and introspective and uh, reverence, uh, a quiet reverence. You know, so so those are some of the differences. But you know, when we are, let's say personally, when we are when we are in prayer, you know, all three can actually flow. It needn't be, okay, now I've praised, now I've worshipped, now I'm going into prayer, right? Personal prayer, you know, personal time. When you're alone by yourself, you know, it can just flow together, right? And uh, it, it can, you can weave in and out. However, when it comes to congregational worship, because it involves people, and there needs to be some kind of flow and some kind of guidance so that people can all engage in, right? So that people don't pull in different directions. One person is, you know, doing this and the other person doing that. So, so therefore, when, when you're congregationally, when you're doing it, it's good to have that kind of a flow of everybody doing the same thing. Otherwise, personal prayer, you can just, you know, do... Um, so you can worship in prayer if that's your question, right? Okay. So can I worship alone in the house without music? Definitely. 
um, how to worship in spirit. So, so when John chapter 4, uh, verse 23 and 24, it talks about in spirit and truth. We are going to actually look at it in detail a little later, but quickly, uh, it talks about our human spirit, spirit, soul, and body. So when we say in spirit, it means um, out of our human spirit, out of our innermost being, and not just a superficial thing, right? Uh, the other words that the Bible has for spirit is heart. It means inner man. So out of your heart, out of your whole heart, you are worshipping. It's not something that is just a superficial thing. It's a deep, in other words, it's a deep communion, right? So we are where you're pouring out the depths of, our, of your heart. You're not holding back anything from God. You're not withholding anything, but from the depths of your heart, you're being sincere, you're being honest, and you're you know, pouring out uh, to God. So uh, that is how we worship in spirit. Another way we worship in spirit is also as led by the Spirit of God. Right? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit could lead us um, to worship in a certain way, to uh, sing out in a certain way, maybe to sing out in the spirit, uh, meaning to pray, in, to sing out in tongues, to worship in tongues, and all that, as led by the Spirit of God. So uh, even the direction, you know, some of those things that uh, you, you realize that Spirit of God is putting those things in your heart, and you are in, resp you know, in response, you are worshiping. The Holy Spirit is maybe reminding us of certain things, you know, about how we were and and then in response, we are worshiping him and saying, God, you brought me out. You lifted me up when I was you know, in, entangled in all these things. You lifted me up. So, yeah, so all those uh, aspects are there when we say we are worshiping in spirit and in truth. Right? Any other questions? So Sandeep's question, can I worship alone in the house without music? Yeah, definitely. Um, so music also, you know, it's, it's not a necessity, but then we see music is part of it. We see music being mentioned there, different kinds of instruments. So if you want to, you know, that's definitely something that you can worship God with, um, you know, because you're directing that to him. Uh, whatever instrument you're playing, you're playing it as unto him. So you can have the freedom to do that as well. Right. Okay. Any of you have any other questions based on what we've been looking at? Right. Okay. So uh, let's look at just a few other scriptures. Um, I'm looking at First Chronicles. Going to First Chronicles, chapter sixteen. Chapter 16, verse 35, the psalmist is saying, And say, and say um, o, save us, O God, of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles. O give thanks to your holy name, to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Right? So this whole thing of triumphing, the whole thing of victory, being victorious. Right? See, when we... Again, when we go back to you know this whole thing of halal, you know, when there's a celebration, there is joy, there's rejoicing, and it comes from a place of victory, right? So when there is victory, we shout out in victory, right? Yeah, sixteen and verse thirty-five. First Chronicles sixteen, verse thirty-five. Yeah. Okay. So, so this whole thing of victory, you know, just in response to victory, most often, right, the expression is a shout. You know, you've seen, you know, maybe, maybe the, the Olympics that just, you know, just got over. In any race, right, when people win, what do they do? Do they are they just walking around with their head down? No. You see that there is a there is a shout. There is a triumph, and there's so much of you know pent up emotions that's coming out and saying, "Yeah, you know, I did it. I got that medal. I got that victory, and I won that race." You know, there's a there is a shout, right? So here also, you know, there are moments when God, you know, where He experienced that breakthrough, He experienced that victory, 
victory and we've got the greatest victory because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, the victory over sin and death, the victory over every curse, right? the victory uh, that he has granted to us. And he's saying, you are victorious because you know I give you that victory. And you know, we look at several scriptures, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. And, and we see all those moments when God leading us, you know, the Bible talks about how he leads us in a triumphant procession in Christ Jesus. Right? So these are moments when we shout out and declare the victory. Right? So, so how does that relate to a church service or maybe people are gathered together and you know how does that relate it relates to something in our own lives that we've been pursuing you know and uh, you know maybe god has granted us a victory and there's a moment when when there is a revelation of the victory of god the victory that the lord has won on the cross and is turned around and given to us right and when the when the song is about that or when there's a you know there's an understanding of that Together, we raise up a voice and shout out uh, a shabak of praise, right? Okay, let's move on to the next one. The next one is this word called, word called Tehillah, right? And it comes from, uh, you know, this word, word it actually, the root word uh, is used for to refer to Psalms, which is Tehillim, which means a collection of, a collection of songs, a book of praises, right? So it means a song of praise. It means a hymn of uh, of praise. It, it could mean a spontaneous song. It could mean something that is thought out and written and so on. So all that. So it is a song, okay? Uh, and it, it's used many times in in the Bible. You know, it's a song of praise. Okay. So yeah, for the first time, we see singing mentioned, right? Or in this, in, in all these five words that we have seen so far, the fifth word that refers to a song right it refers to a song of praise okay um psalm 22 and verse 3 but you are holy enthroned on the praises of your people or praises of israel so the word used there is tehila meaning lord you enthroned you reign who sits on the throne you know the king the one who's the ruler the one who reigns he says you are enthroned you rule and reign on the praises or the songs of your people right so even as we sing praises to him we are kind of singing in expectation saying lord you rule and reign you are enthroned right why is that because these songs of praise are actually songs of truth right songs that are in agreement with who god is that he's the ruler that he's the king that he's the all powerful one that he's the all knowing one so in a situation where you're feeling downcast, where you're feeling low, and when you sing a song of praise, when you raise up a tehillah, and that song is in agreement with who God is, right? the truth of who God is, that he is the deliverer, right? that he is the mountain mover. So when our song, you know, when we are singing, in agreement with the truth, then we will experience the power of that truth. Right? So the Lord releases you know, his rule and reign over that situation. He's saying, God, you are the, the one who's the liberator. You are the one who gives me freedom. Right? In your presence, there is, Lord, there is liberty because there your spirit is, there is freedom. And you begin to experience in your spirit, and then you know, congregationally also, you begin to experience that freedom because the Lord, Lord releases, right? He rules and reigns, he's enthroned in this truth that you are singing up, right? And whatever throne is there, even in our own lives, maybe in that circumstance, is replaced, is brought down, brings down. Why? Because you're lifting up the truth. Like that the truth outlives, overshadows, destroys the lies. Right? The lies that we've been believing, we sing that song. Like for example, I was actually in, um, this happened on a Good Friday service. Right? I was, this is back home uh, uh, and a uh, long time back. 
and I was struggling in certain areas of my life. I was struggling in sin. I was living a double life, right? So as a, I, I was, I don't think I was a, yeah, I was probably a new believer, and I was struggling in, you know, certain areas of sin. And that Good Friday service, we were at a, a friend's church, and um, I saw that, you know, I, I saw the words of the song. Okay, we were all singing one song, and it's an old uh, song. Jesus died and rose again. Only that line. Okay, it's a it's an old song by Hillsong. Jesus died and rose again. And that just convicted me. That line. I'm singing that Jesus died and rose again. Jesus died and rose again. And then suddenly it hit me. Hey, if he died and rose again, then sin has no dominion over you. Right? I was struggling in sin. Suddenly it hit. Jesus died and rose again. That which means the reason for which he rose is to destroy sin. Sin cannot have. Romans 6 talks about that. Sin cannot have. Sin shall not have dominion over you. So in that song, in that tehillah of praise, I experience Jesus being enthroned on the praises of those songs, experience the release and the rule of the king. And it just set me free. You know, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I've been set free from sin. I don't have to be under that cloud of, you know, that, that popular thought that, yes, you know, I have to struggle. I'm only human. You know, all, all men are like this or all humans are like this. I don't have to believe that because Jesus died and rose again. Right? So he is enthroned on the praises of his people. He's enthroned on the tehillah, the songs of praise that rise up. Right? And that is why, you know, our time of singing a song of praise, it's not just, you know, nice, nice melody or, you know, just poetic words or it's not just a filler, you know, before... A time of prayer or before a time of you know, message or sermon. It is actually truth that you are raising up. And truth fights against all lies. Truth comes against all strongholds of the enemy. Because the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy. The enemy is the father of lies. He's the father of deception. Right? So when you sing out, so it's such a spiritual thing. So in the very atmosphere, there is a shift. Right? When there's an atmosphere of fear, and there's an atmosphere of deception, and there's an atmosphere of oppression. Why is it that after a time of praise and worship, you feel refreshed? Why is it? It's because you've come in agreement with truth. We have come in agreement with truth. We have declared truth. We have sung truth. And when we declare truth and we come in agreement with truth, we experience the power of that truth that we are declaring because Christ you know the Lord is enthroned we are saying God yes you rule and you reign and you're actually opening up our heart and opening up that situation for his rule and reign so he enters in and his rule and reign dispels darkness lies deception fear oppression and all kinds of demonic strongholds comes down right and you might have noticed right um you know, maybe some some places where you just you know some meeting during this time of praise and worship, things start manifesting, right? Suddenly, the, the demons cannot keep quiet because why? Again and again, you're declaring truth, so they start getting stirred up. They are manifesting. I remember once um, this is the early days of ministry, and um, I went to this hospital. Um, we received we had received a call saying, you know, there's this person and uh, medically she seems okay but uh, you know emotionally she's struggling and you know she's just scratching herself and uh, you know trying to hurt herself please come and help okay so we went and I went along with pastor and one other pastor and so we went and that's my first time right just going there and praying with someone who is you know being oppressed by them so we were just you know standing around quietly uh, this person a very frail young lady lying down in the hospital bed. So we were, you know, we, we, we said, we pray, and then Pastor said, uh, Jay, why don't we sing, um, you know, He is Lord. Okay, so we started singing that song. You know, He is Lord, He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Four lines, right? 
So we sang, he is Lord, he is Lord, he is risen from the dead. And when we sang that, this lady rose up with a roar, right? With a strength that we don't know where he was. It took three of us grown-up men to just hold her down, right? What happened? We were declaring something that happened 2,000 years ago. He is risen from the dead and he is Lord. It was a tehila, a song of praise, declaring, God, you are Lord. You rose from the dead and you are Lord. And that stirred up the enemy so badly, right? And started manifesting and we prayed and declared and, you know, cast that uh, demon out and then she quietened down and all that, right? So, tehila, a song, a melody, it's powerful. Why? Because it's the truth that you sing. So therefore, the songs that you listen to, the songs that you sing, just be aware of it. Right? What are we singing? What are we declaring? Because it's a confession, right? Uh, it's a it's a declaration. And I'm sure you would have heard. You know, there was this uh, this heavy metal concert and rap concert which happened. After that show, the whole crowd became a mob. They went about rioting. They went about destroying vehicles. They went about, you know, breaking windows and, and all that after a concert. And what were they singing in the concert? Right? It was all about inciting violence. It's all about, you know, hate. And they just, it was, a, it, it was as if hell was released. Right? They just went and you know, did all that. If that is true, we know this is even you know, even better, where righteousness and truth is released, where righteousness and truth is enthroned on the praises. So next time when you when you sing a song of praise, you know, maybe you're going when you're feeling low and you're singing a song of praise, you may not feel it. Right? Emotionally, you may not feel it. But then you know that maybe rationally, unemotionally, you're declaring truth. The feelings will catch up. The feelings will catch up, but then you're declaring the truth of who God is. And there is impact, right? There is a shift in the spiritual realm. And we, God is, you know, you are actually, you know, this God is enthroned. It's a fact, right? He is, he is the ruler. He's sovereign. But you and I, we are coming in agreement with that. You and I are declaring that through the song. And when we do that, you know, he rules and reigns in our hearts, in our minds. Right? We have to give him permission. Right? He stands at the door and knocks. If anyone opens, he comes in. So it depends on our will, our permission. So, Tehela, a song of praise. Let's look at one more. Psalm 40 and verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. You know, you see. Many will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Why? Because of the impact. Because of the impact of the, of the song of praise. Um, and it says that many will come to a like trusting relationship. They will trust in the Lord. Right? Again, a simple song does that. Yes, a song of praise can do that. As it can draw our hearts to him as it can save our lives, right? Some lives are being completely turned around. So also, many will come to trust in him. Many will see and fear, right? That's the impact of a song of praise, a hymn of praise, even a spontaneous song of praise to our God, right? So powerful, right? And there are several other verses. Uh, we're not going into uh, you know, all of them, but I just want to encourage you to read through Okay. And uh, one verse that we will look at is Ephesians 5. Um, and, and I think we, we read it earlier also. Okay, let's go to, let's go to Ephesians 5 and um, things verse 19. Right? Okay. So Ephesians 5 and um, verse 19 says, um, let's read verse 18 and 19. Do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart 
to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Okay, So lifting up these songs to him, singing spiritual songs, hymns, and making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So we are you know, exhorted um, in scripture to do that. Right? Okay. Okay, so another question. How can a sick man worship? Yes, um, I think Sandeep's question is, how can a sick a person who is limited by sickness physically, um, you know, there are limitations, how can one worship? Okay, well, I think we looked at that scripture. Uh, how, uh, or I think we're going to look at it again, but then that verse which talks about the saints, you saints of God, you know, sing aloud on your beds. Right, so which means that posture, singing aloud, is horizontally. You're laying, lying down. You sing aloud on your bed. So, so if you're, if the question is, you know, how can a man rise up? How can a man kneel down? How can a, you know, somebody do that when one is unwell? Well, it doesn't matter. Right? It's the posture of the heart which is very important. Like someone said, you know, in what posture was Jonah in the belly of the fish? When he prayed to God, you know, was he kneeling down? Was he closing his eyes? He was in the belly of the fish. He must have been rolling around, right? Uh, but he, so his posture of the heart, which is very important. So yes, and also um, we see that um, um, you know it's a spirit of of a man, right? The Bible also talks about you know I'm, I'm sure you lean, learn in healing and deliverance, but the spirit of a man sustains a person in sickness, right? Uh, it, which means that. The spirit is unaffected by our, uh, you know, our physical condition. The spirit can continue to worship God. Yes, the expression of that worship is limited because may, I'm tired. I want to sit down, and emotionally also, you know, we are affected by our sickness. You know, we are like, I'm weary. I just want to close my eyes. I, I don't want to think about anything, etc. But then the spirit of man, you know, is uh, uh, can worship. And again, when we say we can worship in spirit and truth, and you can sing songs and in the in the spirit, pray out in tongues and so on. Yeah. So uh, another question: How do angels worship God? Do they worship like us? Um, yeah, most likely because we see we read about you know Lucifer. We read about how he was you know um, in the throne room and worship happening. So angelic beings, we, we see in the book of Revelation, we see these angelic beings, you know, worshiping God. So they're, they're crying out, holy, 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 um, you know, and then we're crying out, uh, crying out who was and who is it is to come. And so, yes, in song, in words, uh, there are these instruments that are mentioned there. And, and so most likely they are, you know, doing that as well, right? They're worshiping God. Another question, can we worship God in tongues? Yeah, definitely we can. Yes, we worship. We can worship God. What is worship? We are magnifying God, and we see in the book of Acts. When we read Acts chapter two. We see the same thing. You know, the the people were surprised. Why? Because they were they were they were speaking in tongues. They were praying in tongues, and in in tongues they were actually magnifying God. So the people who heard they said, you know, we hear in our own tongues people who are actually you know speaking the virtues of God or declaring the praises of God. The same thing we see in Cornelius' house also, Acts chapter ten, where they began to, you know, sh you know, pray in tongues. They were actually declaring the wonderful works of God. So, yes, we can pray in tongues as well. Yeah, or worship God in tongues. And uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, "I will pray with the Spirit. Uh, I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding." So, what is this singing with the Spirit? Obviously, you know, singing in spirit, singing in tongues. He's actually talking about the difference between. Praying with our understanding and praying in tongues, singing with our understanding and singing in tongues. So, we have a scriptural reference there. We we can definitely worship God in tongues, right? Okay. Let's move on to uh, to the next the next thing. Okay, just before we go there, you know, uh, a spontaneous song, right? We looked at song of praise, a hymn. It's also a spontaneous song. That is lifted up, that is raised up to God. Okay, so what is a spontaneous song? Anyone? What is a spontaneous? What is it? What does it mean to be spontaneous? 
not planned right it's not pre planned but at that moment you just you know you just say okay spontaneously they just thought of saying something spontaneously they you know they decided to surprise so it's not pre planned but it's at the moment right so when you say a spontaneous song it's not a song that we have learnt right it's not a song that was composed earlier or what you heard you know just on there on youtube youtube or whatever spotify you didn't learn that song and then you're singing it but it's a song that is birthed in your spirit right it is a song uh, which is overflowing in your spirit and you in response to god you know there's something that you experience about god and then it's just overflowing now that's a spontaneous song okay so when we talk about tehillin or tehila it's also the spontaneous songs that are rising up from our spirit and i think you know we need to really you know pay attention to that right it's uh, because it also it this is this is accomplishes what tehila accomplishes it's a spontaneous song so you sing out to god you sing out a spontaneous song to god put your own melody put your own words or or it could even be a melody which is there right when i when i say melody you know a tune of another song but then you are sp- singing some spontaneous words in in tune with something which is already there it could be there or it could be a fresh something completely new right a fresh tune a new tune a new uh, and new words of uh, the rising up in your heart right and that's a spontaneous song so that also is um, is something that we can bring before god right excuse me okay sorry we're going to look at one more verse one more um word which is barak okay so this barak it means to um, to it's a posture it means to kneel it means to bow down it means to bless and it's an act of you know act of surrender it's an act of reverence right you're bowing down you're kneeling and you're surrendering to god okay so that's again mentioned as praise in the english language but you see that barak is to kneel down barak is to is to even sometimes you know prostrate um to 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 worship god right to praise him right okay this is what we see here psalm 72 verse 11 and verse 15 yeah all kings shall fall down before him all nations shall serve him and he shall live and to him shall be given all the gold of sheba prayer also shall be made for him continually and daily shall he be praised okay so it talks about kneeling it talks about bowing down before god bowing down before him another verse okay um is what we see in psalm 103 was was one was to praise the lord all his works everywhere in his dominion praise him so this is it is barak right so which is to kneel which is to bow down okay so it is an act of again the respect it is an act of surrender you know some cultures have a lot of bowing down right maybe the japanese culture or some of the oriental cultures there's a lot of bowing down that's happening okay. uh, we don't do that so much right but in some cases so what does that uh, what does that signify respect right you're you're humbling yourself right you're respecting the other person but you're actually you're you're lowering yourself you're humbling yourself and you're saying okay i, I just humble myself before you right and uh, and so many of these cultures do that to the elders or even to the peers you know they just bow down and uh, to each other in order as a as a greeting even right so barak is similar to that we are just bowing down we are humbling ourselves before god right we are humbling we are saying god i'm i'm humble i'm humble i'm bringing myself low what does it mean to humble you know you're bringing yourself low right you're lowering yourself and you're saying god i i just humble and this is in a healthy way right it is not to you're not putting yourself down you're not you know hating yourself or condemning yourself or humiliating yourself right there's a difference between 
humbling yourself and humiliating yourself. You know, humiliating is your taking all kind of dignity and respect. You know, you're, you're taking that out of your life. That's not what God wants, right? God wants us to be humble before Him, right? Because He gives grace to the humble. James 5 talks about that. He gives grace to the humble. And so we are required to humble ourselves, but not humiliate, you know. Um, and also, you know, same thing. When we are encouraging people to humble themselves, to lower themselves down, we're not encouraging them to humiliate themselves, nor should we humiliate, right? Um, like remove dignity and respect and everything out of their lives. No, because it's God has given them the dignity. God has given them the respect. And who are we to dismantle that, right? Because we are, they are the workmanship of God. We are the workmanship of God. So we, it is scriptural to humble ourselves, to, to in, in kneeling down, right? In lowering ourselves, in bowing down. Okay, so this we see many times in the Bible. It's again a word of praise. Um, so yeah, so this is good. So we bow ourselves down before God. Many times what happens is you know, we have this understanding of God as our Heavenly Father. Right? We have this understanding of the Lord Jesus as our friend, right? to whom we can share, to whom we can converse, to whom we can like pour out our hearts, etc. So it becomes like, you know, he's my buddy. Like, he's my buddy. I just put my arm around him and walk with him. And yes, he is. Right? He is the one who is closer than any of our earthly relationships. So yes, he's Emmanuel, God with us. But the fact is we cannot lose sight of the reverence, of the awe and the awesomeness of God. Right? Yes, he is with us. Yes, he's our friend. Yes, he is, you know, we can we can talk to him, we can tell him our joy, our sorrow, our pain, our, our deepest, darkest, you know, secrets and everything. We can just confess, and it's it's amazing. There's true freedom in his presence, right? With him. That's true communion, deep fellowship. But we can never lose sight of the fact that he is a holy God. He's an awesome God. Right? He's, he dwells in unapproachable light, but he has made a way for us to come to him. Right? He has made a way for us to draw near through the blood of Jesus. Right? See, he's worthy of respect and honor and, and awe. And, and so we should never lose sight of that as well. Right? While we, while we, the other aspect of the truth is this, close fellowship, communion, etc., should also not lose sight of the fact that he's a God who is awesome, he's worthy to be praised, and so on. So we kneel, we kneel down, we lower ourselves down, and sometimes we just prostrate before him because we are in awe of who he is. Right? Sometimes we're just filled with this you know, reverential fear of God. You know, I remember during a supernatural hour, I think in the last semester, for me personally, you know, as we just started. You know, I, I just felt cold, right? I was about to start the song and it just felt cold. And it was not like the temperature was cold or anything. You know, it was uh, probably in summer. So it felt cold. And this awe of God, you know, this reverential fear of who God was, right? And, um, and there's something awesome that God is all that He say. Yes, right. For example, if you want to have a glimpse of the awesomeness of God, you know, the Bible talks, I mean, the, you know, we know science talks about how the sun is, right? The sun, very far away from the earth. If the earth were to move, you know, earth is on an orbit around the sun, right? Going around and around. So if the earth were to move closer to the sun, like away from the orbit, closer to the sun, there will be no life on earth. No life, because everything will be burnt up, scorched. So that's how powerful the sun is. Right? That's how hot the sun is. If we were to move far away from the, from the orbit, you know, maybe a few meters or kilometers away from the orbit, we would freeze up. 
right? Everything would freeze because the temperature would not be suitable to sustain life on Earth. Okay, so the sun is there, and they say that on the surface of the sun, okay, the sun's surface, it is very volatile, right? We when we look at it, we're not able to look at it, right? Uh, we just shield our eyes and look at the sun, and we feel the heat, right? And we are actually far away from the sun that it takes a few minutes for the rays to actually travel and come to the earth. So we are so far away, right? It takes a few minutes for the rays to travel. We're talking about light traveling. It takes some time for the light to come and hit us on earth. So therefore, then we say, okay, ah, sun has come and you know, we rise up and all that. Okay. Now the surface of the sun is so volatile, so volatile, meaning it's like a million, they say it's like a million atom bombs, nuclear bombs, which are going out, which are, you know, like exploding every second. Okay. You know, if you if you want to get an idea of you know one atom bomb, one nuclear weapon which was used that destroyed a whole community, like a whole city, right? I mean, it was used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the end of the Second World War. 1945, right? It destroyed. The heat was so much that it would just melt metal. Buildings, whole buildings would just be melted. Not just broken down into rubble, but melted because the heat is so much, right? That is the heat which was generated from an atomic bomb, right? So on the surface of the sun, scientists say that it's like a million times that every second. Now the Bible says in Genesis that God spoke and created that. Right? God spoke and created. So that's how awesome our God is. He spoke things into existence. He says, let there be. And he created it. And he placed it, you know, if you look at the sun and if you look at the earth and, you know, all these minute things, all these minute, you know, adjustments, the atmosphere, the salinity in the sea, the sea, you know, the salt level in the sea. And, and you know, in our bodies also we have, you know, magnesium, iron, all these metals which is, they say, which is there on the earth, right? And all that, you know, because we are created. Out of the dust he created. So all that metals, everything is there, magnesium, everything is there in our body also, right? So everything points to scripture. And the Bible says that he spoke it. He just said, let there be, and he spoke it into existence. So this Emmanuel, God with us, is that God, awesome God, powerful God, right? So in his presence, that's why the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Every knee will bow. You know, you don't have to say, now kneel down. No. Some knees will bow down acknowledging Jesus, yes, you are my Lord. But other knees will bow down saying in fear, saying, oh, he is actually the Lord. I didn't receive, I didn't accept, you know, I rebelled, but he is actually the Lord. Right? Even those rebellious knees will bow down in, in the understanding that Jesus is Lord. So the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. You know, some tongues will be like joyfully confessing, Jesus is Lord. You know, we're so glad. But then some will be out of fear and saying, oh, he is actually Lord. Right? So that's the thing. When we kneel down, when we bow down, it's with this understanding. He's an awesome God. He's a God who's who is a creator God. He spoke things, awesome things into existence. And he is our God. And he says, you know, I am with you always. Right? What an awesome privilege. We are blessed. He says, I am your provider. I'm Emmanuel, God, with us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm with you till the end of the ages. You know, what more can, what more do we need? What more do we want? Right? This awesome God is saying that he's promising, he's making a covenant and saying, you know, I'm with you. I'll be with you. Right? So, so that's the thing. When it comes to Barak, 
this posture. Just remember that. He's an awesome God. Okay. Um, okay, what if someone does not praise and worship even after knowing all these words? Probably there's a reason why they are not. You know, there's a, always a good reason why people are the way they are. <laughs> so we need to find out, I guess, why. You know, why, why is it? What's the problem? Yeah, maybe they are angry with God. Right? They're angry with God for something. They, they misunderstood Him. So, yeah. So knowledge does not necessarily lead to action. But revelation and when you receive it and in faith you walk and that is what leads to, you know, action, right? So, yeah. So it's possible. Romans talks about that. Although they knew God, they did not. They exchanged the glory of God for something that was created. Romans 1 talks about that, right? So it's very possible, right? But, you know, when we are in a relationship with God, then, um, yeah, so I was just about to say, Regala, I was about to say that, you know, um, when we are in a relationship with God, then all this flows. You know, we are. We continue to grow in our understanding, in our revelation of God, and even in our expression of worship to Him. Um, it comes from that place of relationship. It comes from that place of intimacy. Yeah. So your question is, um, can we make relationship with God through worship and praises? Okay. So can we can we draw? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, it we can, but. Um, but we know that uh, you know at the core of it is to receive him as lord and savior so if you, if you're talking about someone who is you know does not have a relationship with god who is not you know who's not a follower of jesus who's not so then you know one needs to come to that place of receiving him as lord and savior well these times of praise and worship can actually be a revelation you know it's like a window that is open and saying hey this is who god is you know, can you see? You know, it's giving giving a view of God. Another song is giving a different you know view of a different aspect of God, of the beauty of God. Another song is giving a different aspect of you know His holiness and His love and care and so on. So yes, all these songs and the people praising and worshiping will certainly give an understanding to the person who does not yet have a relationship with God. Gives an understanding. Hey, this is who this God that they are worshiping is. And then when there is a song which says, you know, oh, come to the altar, a song of invitation to come and be, you know, and start that in relationship with God, uh, then, yeah, that person can enter into a relationship with God. Okay. John 4, 24. How do we worship in truth? Yeah, so that is what we were looking at. So truth is the opposite of lie. So anything that is opposite of a lie. So practically speaking, you know, when 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 uh, when we say we are worshiping in truth, that is according to the word of God, because the word of God is truth. It's not like you know I think of my own ways or I manufacture my own ways of worshiping Him, uh, but you know what the word what the Father wants. Like He's seeking the true worshippers who worship in spirit. So according to God's word, without any pretense, right? We're not pretending. Uh, we're not being hypocrites, but we are being sincere and truthful. Um, yes, so that it, that. So that is that is what it is when you say we're worshiping in spirit and in truth, right? Okay. Okay. I think we with that we come to the end of uh, today's class. We have a minute, so maybe you can go through the next one, Zamar, and here's where we we see music being mentioned here to make music and to sing songs, right? Okay. Thank you. We'll stop here. God bless.